people that want things quieter. How rock and roll is fucking that? It's not very rock and roll, but it's realistic. Um, I'm here for Stephen Fryett, who makes things quieter, but also in the rock and roll idiom, makes things louder uh, if it's too quiet. Because most attenuators make things quiet, but not loud. Uh, so he made the quieter maker, which is probably what your wife wants, but also the louder maker, which is what you want. And uh, <laughs> with all uh, something you do, I don't know how you say that, there's the man, and uh, here's his creation. You know it, you love it, it's the Power Station PS2A. I don't know what the 2A means, it's probably version 2, the first one of it, or something like that, right? Uh, the 2A is different from the 2 in that it's got a variable line out control on the back where the previous one had uh, the the low pass filter that you could switch on and off. And since most people decided they didn't care about the low pass filter, but they really did care about having more control over the line level, uh, that's what we did. We switched to that. We're very... It, we try to be really responsive to feedback that we get from customers, especially as it relates to recording applications, because those things are the easier that you can make it for people to use it as for all the possible things that you could use it for, the better it is for us. So, so we don't have to come up with as many workarounds for end users when they're saying, but I want to do this. And of course we get a lot of that. So um the original idea of having the low pass filter on there was um was to take some of the sting out of a loaded amp going into a reactive load but then we refined the behavior of the reactive load and then more people found that as they're using irs having that little sting in the top actually affected the behavior of the ir in what they perceived as a positive way so it sort of obsoleted the idea of having the low the switchable low pass filter so we took it out put a line I mean, out I, level control in as, place it, as it. it stands yet now as of today 2021 later in the year there isn't the perfect load box I have had probably every single one here. I probably have most of them here. Uh, I have one from Red 7 there right now. I haven't even plugged it in. Great box. But you know what? No attenuator. It's, it's, it's a pure load box. So with IRs, which is great. And they're saying at 800 bucks, it's their re reactive uh, uh, response if, is much better than two notes. All possible. But you can't freaking attenuate. Just like most of the two notes product don't attenuate. Now, US is an attenuator, but then of course you can't load IRs. And um, th there's reason for that. And you, you don't want to deal with software and, and all that stuff, which I can totally understand. As it stands right now, you have to know as a customer, what do I want from my load box IR loader attenuator? Maybe even a combination of two products that you need to get. What do I want? What's my application? And then buy the right one. You can't buy one. That'll just cover everything. It just doesn't exist at the moment. And not the TAE from Boss, the tube amp expander, not the Captor X, and not the power station. They all do different things. And it's my job to look at them and explain the ever-growing jungle of features because it's so complicated. People are like, oh, I want something that makes it quieter. Do you want to go in your computer with it? Yeah. Well, how good does the quieter making have to be? Because you can buy an aux, which will make it quieter, and it goes in a computer with light pipe, which is great. It's got a digital out killer go into your audio interface. But the quieter is bedroom playing quieter, totally fine for making it living room compatible. Not for let's make it quieter and actually put a mic in front of a cab. For that, in my opinion, and that's I'm not saying that because well, let's get rid of him. Um, I'm not saying that because Mr. Forehead's right here. In my opinion, the power station is the one to get. And I'm saying that because I've been sitting next to one, playing it through a cab, and the feeling is as if there's no attenuator in between your amp and the cab. And the reason for that is, and Stephen explained that to me last year, um, when you have an attenuator, your amp will see the attenuator, and the attenuator, if it's good, has a reactive load, meaning... It mimics the behavior of a cab. And your amp, your tubes in your amp will behave just like, hopefully, um, the amp behaves with the cabinet. 
However, the cabinet doesn't see the amps. The cabinet doesn't see the tubes. The cabinet sees your attenuator and then kind of like just sits there and is not quite as alive as it should be. So with the power station, what happens is your amp sees the reactive load and does what it's supposed to do. It behaves like an amp. It's alive. And your cab sees the tubes in the power station, which is actually sending a, let's call it line signal, um, into the tubes. And your cab, again, sees tubes. It doesn't see the amp's tubes, but it sees the power station tubes. So your cab's happy because it's seeing tubes. Your amp's happy because it's seeing a reactive load. But with that power station in the middle, you have the ability to change the level. But both elements that are important for sound sculpting, which is your amp and your cab, are behaving the way that they're supposed to behave. Stephen, is that correctly illustrated? I couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly what the intent and the um, and the result of the power station was and is to uh, uh, fool the amp into believing that it's plugged in to a speaker cab and fooling the speaker cab into thinking that it's plugged into the amp. And in between what's going on is you're establishing a different level of volume control for the, the two behaviors that you're trying to preserve and not only preserve them, but maybe even expand on them, adjust them a little bit, refine them, tweak them differently uh, so you can maintain what everybody wants to call transparency. Transparency is a, a number of things and it could be anything. It could be, but transparency generally, it, what it boils down to is what you prefer to hear. And if you hear it the way you want to hear it, it's transparent, which means it's right to you. And if it isn't 100% right to you, we've given you switches and knobs to be able to make it righter. And, Actually, very simple. If we look at the, the front, there's a warm and a bright. And what that is doing, that's kind of tweaking the the that... Uh, a reactive, reactive re response, pretty much. Um, and you very quickly find out, uh, 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 done. And you just have the, the sound you want. You could say, well, isn't that what the... And of course, Stephen can say that because he's Mr. Freyetza, but I can say it. Why well, isn't that what the tube amp expander does? It also has a power amp in it. Well, yes, but that is not a two power amp. So your cab doesn't respond to it in the same liveliness. The tube amp expander has tweakable... Uh, reactiveness, which yes, you there's two uh, a switch uh, to two two knobs, and you very likely switch that once. Find the one you like. That's what I did, and you're good. Um, but then it'll make it loud with a not sure if that's class D or class AB. I think it's class AB, something like this. Um, it's, cl it's class AB. Yeah, it's a solid state. Yeah. It's not class D power. But it's a class AB power. But it's not your cab doesn't see tubes, and you would think. Yeah, that's bullshit. I mean, do you really notice? All I can say is I have all of them. I've tested them. And I really did notice a, a difference in how I responded to the sound coming out of the speaker. That, that, that's, that's all I can say. Now, obviously, the TAE has effects built in and MIDI and XLR out. What doesn't it have? It doesn't have freaking digital out, which is... How stupid is that? But then you have the aux, and it has digital out. Doesn't even have MIDI. What? And it can't make loud. Um, so, again, there isn't the perfect thing. If the power station, for example, gives you a DI out. Let's turn it around. So it gives you a DI out right here with XLR or line out right there, which mm -hmm. is a line level what comes out of your amp, which you then can pump into your audio interface, record a line level into your DAW, and then put an IR on there. Right. And if your interface with latency and all that is quick enough, you could even play through it real time. For me, I don't want to play through my computer. So what you can do is you could pump that into um, two nodes cab M or any kind of IR loader, but it itself doesn't simulate any cab. What comes out is a scratchy kind of icky sound that, you know, isn't cabinated. Okay? Right. Um, so, by itself, this does not fulfill what some other products on the market do. The idea is, let's put it on a cab, 
And of course, you can get the eye out, but the best idea, the real idea is let's put it on a cap and mic that cap because I like that cap. I like that cap. I like that cap. <laughs> that should be a slogan. You can have that, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, the, there's a reason that it doesn't have that software based stuff in it. And the reason is software based stuff gets obsolete. But the reactive load technology is not going to change the way those things behave. The only thing that changes the way they behave and how effective they are is how we design them and how we may redesign them or modify them going down the road. But the technology isn't going to change. The tube technology of the output stage isn't going to change, isn't going to become obsolete. It eventually will. Yeah. In my lifetime, maybe, maybe not. But it, we still there is something magical about the behavior of a tube power amplifier that is pretty irreplaceable for the perceivable future and that makes the power station design stable and with regard to uh, the obsolescence it's not going to become obsolete in near the time span that any software based solutions that may be built into it would be uh, chips become obsolete all the time and they, they become parts that you can no longer buy. The software that you use to program them changes and evolves. And there's all kinds of stuff going on there that makes that that makes those things yesterday's news literally a day after they come out. Now you're fully right. This is a this is a product that can work with a tube amp and a cap in 30 years. And uh, even if the software doesn't exist anymore. Now, of course, the way I use my aux is um, uh, preset one and I'm done. So even if the software never changed, it, it never gets updated, I'll still use it. One, let's go into another difference, for example. You can see there's a, an effects loop here. And right. on the TAE, on the on the BOSS, was a tube amp expander, you can put effects in. And then that class AB amp sends it to the cab and the effects come out of the cab as well. Same thing right. here. So if you want to put effects on your uh, vintage Plexi, no effects loop, no anything, and you want the effects, time-based effects, delay, reverb, behind the sound, behind the sound that the power amp makes, um, you could do it in a mixing board, but that won't come out of your speaker. So here right. you put the effects in the effects loop um, of the power station, and it actually then comes out of your speaker. And that's obviously a great way to put uh, effects behind it. As far as I understand, is uh, that's something that Eddie did. He kind of something pulled the power down, something behind his plexis with something, and then actually put effects behind it. People were talking about the, the phaser that he used behind the amp somehow. But I, I I literally know nothing about this stuff. That would have just been that that would have just been using a, like a, a a line out attenuation, which is basically the concept here of of when you plug your amp into the load and then the load is attenuated down to line level, which is then fed through the effects loop and to the power amp section. So it's a similar idea. Um, um, I, I gotta get I got the I gotta get the hundred so we actually look at the differences because we can actually cover this together. I'll be right back. So for your kids out there that want to know what to buy, I'm already giving you a couple of ideas what the boss will do, what this will do, what this will do. If you're looking at the power station, you're like, well, should I spend the extra 200 bucks on the 100 because 100 is more than 50? If we look at the two units, um, at the bottom is the PS2A, at the top is the PS100. Um, different power amp tubes, but what we covered in a different video if I'm correct, Stephen, uh, even though they're different kinds, they kind of serve the same purpose and they're kind of 6L6-ish. And even if they're one, two gives a shit, right? That's correct. Uh, they're, for the most part, up to a certain output level, they sound identical. It's when you get past the power uh, saturation point of the 50 that the 100 starts to sound different, but it's not really different. It's just maintaining its transparency at a higher output level. Okay. It's really going on there. Technically, layout-wise, we could say it's very similar, mm -hmm. but it actually, if you, actually the layout is exactly the same, but if you look at what's happening, um, the 100 did away with the second speaker out. Right. Um, and added the foot switch. So right here, 
It says foot switch. Foot switch. Uh, and it comes with a foot switch. Other than that, we got all the same stuff. So if you look at the front, oh, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, two of those weigh a little bit. Um, obviously, big difference. The 50, other than having 50 watts, um, chicken heads instead of non chicken heads. What do you call these? Uh, knobs. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry. You, you can see it's got the same reactive load stuff, uh, but it has two, not channels, kind of two presets. You know, you could switch uh, in a live situation uh, between, is it foot switchable? Yes, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, you could switch in a live situation between uh, one setting and the other uh, for a, for a lead boost, for example, um, which would be great. You know, you have a, a, an amp that you're kind of attenuating and then you're kicking it more for the for the solo without actually changing how the amp's power amp has to behave. So you have the perfect sweet spot of your of your Marshall or whatever you're using, and then you're just making it louder uh, with the power station. Now, right. that foot switch doesn't just switch between, and this, this is something where I'm going to get get in his grill a little bit here, um, doesn't just switch the two different setups. I don't want to call them channels, but it also switches the effects loop on and off. And, Steven, there's me. The 50 cannot switch off the effects loop, correct? That's right. I don't like that. Um, <laughs> sorry. <you're> sorry. <laughs> You're allowed. You're allowed to not like that. Um, uh, the it, it didn't become apparent to anybody that it wasn't switchable until the PS100 came out that was. And then it was, um, well, why didn't you do that on the PS100? Well, or on the PS2. And, uh, well, it just didn't seem to be, uh, well, first of all, Jack space. The rear panel is very compact, and, and it's either the and, second uh, speaker or the foot switch. Right, and uh, we sort of perceived that people might want uh, the second speaker output. When we came around to doing the PS100, we said, "How many people really are going to use a second speaker output anyway? It's got to be a very small percentage." Not, let's just not, say not, not me. Let's just say it's ten percent. If ten percent uh, want the dual speaker out. Would that would that mean that by extension, ninety percent of people would benefit from the foot switchable loop and the foot switchable presets? Yes, absolutely. So um, we made that we made that design decision, and as a result of that, the ten percent turned out to be a pretty loud ten percent. And but I can't put two speakers on the output of the PS one hundred. Well, yes, you can. You just have to use a Y box of some kind. You just they're just not accessible on the back of the well, why didn't you put an, an extra jack in there? Well, and then you've the got back. people like me who's yelling at you about the foot switchable effects loop. My my yeah, only thing look, is, and and I, the answer is look at the back. Where would you have us put that jack? There's no space. Uh, we have to make it bigger. Do we want to make it bigger? Do you want it bigger? No, you already think it's as big as it should possibly be. So we don't really want to make it bigger. And that means that we have to figure out how to cram more stuff in there. And as with every design, with every product we put out that has a lot of features, it's you did nine things. Why didn't you do the tenth? And the answer is, if we had done the tenth, we would be talking about why isn't the eleventh one in there? And that's always the way it is. The expectation that there could be one more thing that you didn't think of. Sure, we thought of it. We thought about probably five different things that that if we put in there, you would have asked for us yet a sixth. So it's always like that. There's always the trade-off between practicality, usability, functionality, physical space, cost, and size, and weight. All of those things go into the design of a product. So, yeah, you, at, at some point you have to draw the line. And then once we've drawn the line, then we leave it up to the consumers to, to start pounding on the door. And the people who pound the hardest and the loudest are the ones that get their, get their additional little feature added. And sometimes to the, to, the, uh, to the detriment of a feature that nobody talked about or said they needed and when until we take it out and then they're 
oh, why did you take out the low pass filter on the PS2A? Man, that was that was like the thing that I really depend on. And well, uh, okay, get the PS2. You still the PS2 still, but I like that line out thing. Okay, well, you know. There is- <laughs> well, I I hope you can forgive me for. Um, uh, uh, ending my review saying the, the the one gripe I would have with it that I would like a foot switchable um, effect loop. The, the reason that I'm thinking of it is I would likely have it in a rack in the studio as a studio tool. And if I have that um, that delay back there, this tape delay, which I would love to have in the effects loop for all my amps in there, that is definitely something I want to take out if I'm not using it because it is a noisy box. Um, and uh, the thing is, you technically have a very simple and quick response to me saying, why doesn't it have that? Just buy the PS100. I mean, if I'm already spending the grand, why not spend 1200, get 50 extra watts and get the feature that I want. So you have the thing for the people that want two outputs, which is the PS2A, um, and they're going to have to be okay with 50 watts. And if you want the foot virtual effects loop, well, then get the 100. Yeah, okay, there's a difference in wattage, but there's also a difference in that feature. And for me, if I'm really that bitchy about it, which I am, then the 200 have- shouldn't be an issue. Right. Right. And there's, there's always that, you know. On, and, and then uh, what you're talking about is balancing the marketing approach against the practical reality. And there's, there's always nuance to that. And there's always things to talk about. Uh, one thing that's really important to know about the loop and loops in devices like this in general is that um, the loop can be used to do other things. It can be used as a power amp in. It can be used as a as a, an, a, a lower level line out. There's all kinds of ways you can use it. But the important thing about it is, is that it doesn't alter this the type of signal that's coming out and th- that's that's going through the loop. So if you use an analog device in the loop, it stays analog. If you use a digital device in the loop, uh, you go th- your signal goes through the D to A, uh, the A to D, and then the D to A in your effects processor, and then back in. So in that in that context, your signal is um, is processed through digital processing. Uh, but you have the ability of using a device that when it's in bypass, you're back to analog. And that's the real important thing about the loop in uh, in the TAE, for example, everything is converted what, after the signal is taken off of the reactive load in that device, everything is converted to digital, goes through the signal routing, the loop, the the effects, the IRs, all of that, the mixing, all that, and then convert it back to analog before it goes to the power amp. So while they pitch the power amp as being analog, uh, by saying it's a class AB power amp, it's a traditional solid state power amp, it's not class D. So it's not what anybody would perceive as a digital power amp, it's class AB. And in that sense, they're saying it's analog, be, and it's it's better because it's a it's an analog power amp, great. But they've already converted the signal to the digital domain and then back into the analog domain to put it in a power amp that they can call analog. And great. And as you pointed out, the behavior of the power amp uh, with respect to the speaker is not as lively and reactive as it would be with a tube power amp. And so there's uh, there's that. And then some people have made comments about, well, is it is the load is the load thing safe in there? And I my position is that it generally is that that's not really a concern. All they're doing on their load is they're front loading the reactive behavior more, so that the solid state power at, at the end will seem more reactive, and that's a good thing. I mean, that would have been a good engineering decision to make, and they of course went with. A solid state power amp to reduce cost and weight on that part of the design so they can focus more of the product budget into the signal processing, which is great. But the end result is your signal is always going through uh, analog to digital and digital to analog processing. And there's no it's it's a different it's a different customer. It's the customer yeah, that a, wants to go customer. front it's a totally different it's a customer of thing. It's and a customer okay. that, that wants built in effect. Right. And go front of house with XLR in stereo uh, with the 
IR while also controlling the level of their cap on stage, which yeah. then isn't as purist as what you can get with the power station. Whereas with the power station, you have someone that wants a purist approach of I stay analog, I'm, I'm miking my cap. Um, if you wanted to build a product that Boss has done and Fryet has done, stay that true with the tubes and analog, but then have a completely parallel uh, digital thing happening where there's maybe digital effects built in that go in an effects loop, um, a, probably a parallel effects loop, so it actually stays analog. And DI with IRs, we're literally looking at a product that likely will be in the 2000 to 2500 dollar exactly. range. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's not that Boss didn't want to do it, it's not that Frayette didn't want to do it, but at some point no, you're com you're coming up with a thing that where you say, well, but it, I can buy an amp for that. Yes, you can, but it's going to be loud. Now, the, the, the other thing what, that I want to point out is uh, some of the uses of the power station that, that, that people might not be thinking of that really blew my mind when I uh, reviewed the 100, which is um, it, it's, a, it's a two power amp. So realistically, before I would buy a two power amp from anyone, I would buy a power station because it is a two power amp. You can put your Helix through it. And uh, I think the Helix is a great product, but it does sound like a, like a modeler. Now, if you turn the speaker off in the Helix, send it into the power station line in and that into a cab, holy shit, did it sound phenomenal. Now, obviously you're adding a thousand to twelve hundred bucks in on top of the helix, but what you're adding is a tube power amp, and uh, that is something we shouldn't forget. That you're not just buying an attenuator to make your amp quieter or a quiet amp louder, and I'm going to get to that. But you can tubify stuff that really needs it, and if you have a helix and you're willing to carry the power, well. We get into, does that make sense? Because the one helix or the one modeler argument is convenience. Uh, ease of use, ease of travel. If I'm taking a helix and a cap, a, a helix and a cap and a power station, we're very quickly getting to the point where, hmm, might as well take an amp and a, and a board. Maybe not, okay? <laughs> but, maybe not. But, but you know what I mean. I mean, then you have to weigh off, is the convenient, you, you're getting the point. Moving on. Quiet amps louder. I have to say, and, 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 and Steve and I, we had conversations about that. My first reaction to making a quiet amp louder was a little bit disappointing with the PS100. And now I understand why that is. I was thinking, put any amp in it. And what I can get out of the 100 or the 50 is a 100 watt amp volume or a 50 watt amp volume. Um... And that's not exactly what's happening. So I want to issue a little bit of a warning to you guys, uh, hopefully with Steve's uh, uh, blessing, that you're not going to get a one watt amp or a five watt amp and fill a stadium with it. Will it turn into a band usable amp? Yes. Will it be a gigable amp all of a sudden, which a five watt amp would never be? Yes. Will it fill a stadium like your 100 watt plexi no and i think and please correct me if i'm wrong the reason why that is is the power station sucks up all the volume and creates a line level signal is that correct and that line level signal is being amplified by the tubes 50 mm -hmm. or 100 watt and if you're putting in a 100 watt amp you probably have to switch this to that's a sensitivity, so probably a low sensitivity, right? Yeah, it's, there's, there's no, there's no rule there. It's just what works best for you. But so yeah. you have you have two settings. You're pumping in a lot of volume. You know, switch one. You're pumping in less volume. Switch to the other, mm -hmm. and there simply isn't one that is that will, and, and that changes how your line level signal gets created. How how mm -hmm. big it is. Right. Now a one watt amp has will create a smaller line level signal. And there mm -hmm. just isn't a third setting that will make that one watt amp a louder signal. 
that that is all that it is um if there was and if you know thousands of people wrote to Stephen saying hey um we're using one watt amps it would have that switch but i'm pretty sure that even between a one watt and a five watt amp there's still a rather big difference in 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 how much signal it creates and what i tried was a one watt app and i expected it to be ridiculously loud and it just wasn't so yeah there's there's always there's always a little trade-off there and is it possible to make it more uh um more compatible in that particular application yeah sure um that that gets down into the into the weeds how much do you how much is people? How much are people really going to do that? And how much does it really need to be? And if if just by offering it as a feature that most people haven't even run up against yet, then it becomes uh, when I said it this way, it's really noisy. And here's what I'm using. Well, you're not using a one watt amp, so you don't really need to use that feature. And so sometimes uh, in the development of a product. The a number of possibilities that you offer have to be weighed against how many customer support emails is that going to generate to explain <laughs> fully, why you fully did understand. Or did not do and and I, I actually so, don't know of a lot of one watt amps. I have the killer amp, which is a great amp, but probably most low wattage amps will be five watt, which already are again quite a bit louder. And I have a solution to the nice people out there that want their one watt amp to be amplified to be louder. What you do is you buy the PS2A, put your one watt amp into that. That will make it considerably louder, which you then pump into the PS100, <laughs> which will then put it into a hundred watt amp. Okay, so you can say that. We, we could never be that crass. Of a, of a marketing organization. But I mean, if you really want your one watt amp to be 100 watts, just buy both of them and you're good. <laughs> well, now we laugh, but there actually is a practical way to represent that as an advantage rather than just an excuse to sell two power stations. <laughs> and this, and here it is. You plug your one watt amp into a PS2. And then you take the speaker out of the PS2 and plug it into the amp in of the PS, its own amp in. Oh. So your one your one watt amp, you actually instead of you presumably your one watt amp might have a line out jack so that you can you can use a line out jack and not a load. Uh, if you can do that, then you could take your one watt amp, plug it into the line in, plug the power station two output into its own amp input, and then take that line out and plug it into the PS100. And now you would have your one watt amp that's cranked and then be able to put it into the PS2 and crank its power amp to add bigger tube power amp saturation, take the line out of that, go into an effect and into the PS100, which has a cleaner power amp. And then you would have the most devastating, stupid sounding rig on the planet. <laughs> but of course you have to drag more gear around to do it. But yeah. Those are some of the insane things that we come up with to, to show people how to do. But you know, surprisingly we made a video of using the PS2 with a preamp and reamping itself, and then going, uh, you know, going direct into a DAW and then into an IR, and that added all kinds of mojo to a preamp, and it was phenomenal. And a lot of people glommed onto that and are doing that, so that's great. Oh, that's the other uh, thing. Obviously, don't forget there are preamps, and uh, other than attenuating or attenuating, attenuating, what's making it louder? Amp amplifying Boost, i guess boosting yeah. i guess the word's amplifying but i'm gonna say it's yeah, b-tenuating yeah. because that's funny <laughs> <laughs> or it's actually z-tenuating because at the, at the opposite end of the alphabet ah <laughs> right here okay. the z-tenuator <laughs> um <laughs> you can have that one um it it it's it's a two power amps so you have a preamp You'll go in there you have, writing that down. yeah write I, that I, down I, the z-tenuator um okay. actually that 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 word just looks good um so uh 
there yeah before realistically before i buy just a power amp um unless it, it's like a 50 50 or you are what's it called the z lx2 lx2 yeah um uh, which is stereo if i wanted stereo uh but if right. i wanted mono realistically before i buy two power amp i'd buy a power station because it gives me a lot more options um to take a low wattage amp and make it louder to tame a big amp and really get it to the sweet spot and take it down um and uh, you know modelers preamps all that stuff uh, it's it's way more flexible than just seeing it as an attenuator. If you see it as an attenuator, you have to also compare it to the other things on the market that call themselves attenuators. And some of them are feature the digital stuff and other things. So you have to figure out for your situation, do you go live? Do you have to make it quiet? Do you just need an IR loader? In, in which case there are things that just load us but don't make it quiet. It's a jungle out there and... I, I've been in the jungle. I've made PDF documents for everything. Um, mm. I have to say, as a pure attenuator, used with a cab, there's nothing that beats the power station. And I, I, I have all of them. Um, I don't know if you know that, Stephen. Um, at Gear Street this year, for the living room, I needed a cab. We had an angle cab there. All the other rooms only had purely uh, uh, um, monitor speakers. From LD systems uh, running, uh, being fed by uh, Captor Access. But in the living room, we had a cab. And, but I couldn't have people pump 100 watt amps in there. So uh, behind the MP switch, I actually had the, the PS100, and that was the thing that tamed everything. So uh, that's in every single video that came out of the living room. Wow. Um, and <clears throat> we, uh, we had a company that actually, we're not going to say who, makes an attenuator that they wanted in the picture, and we tried it but it was broken. So uh, that one broken unit uh, got you a lot of screen time. <laughs> um, uh, also a great product, but for me, realistically, the power station is what I would want to use um, if I'm going into a cab. Well, um, the, fun thing about the, the fun thing about the power station for us is that it's all the other uses that people have figured out for it and what we have discovered by getting questions from people you know i have this situation and i have this rig and this how can i hook these together to accomplish x and we go hey you know what that's actually a great situation and and we hadn't thought about it but now that you bring up the question you can do this and this and this and this and this and, and achieve your x and they're like wow great i didn't know i could do that and frankly we didn't think about whether or not it could do that either until you asked so we get a lot of feedback like that that results in interesting new outcomes. So like one of them was the self-attenuator thing using preamps to get mojo. That turned out to be a really cool thing. And recently, I just stumbled across, for my own application, uh, another way to use the power station in a unique rig. And you'll probably be, you'll probably pick up on this immediately once I start describing it, but you have done the the synergy demos and you've got the the sin amp but you also have played with the sin one and the sin two mm -hmm. and uh you know that the sin one and sin two have a feature on them that allows you to use that box to add channels to an existing amp that you might have that has an effects loop yep. right okay so you have a, a little combo amp Maybe it's a single channel amp, maybe it's a multiple channel amp that you don't like one of the channels or whatever, but at least it's got an effects loop. So what you do is you put the SIN 1 or SIN 2 on top of the thing and you hook it up in the add channel configuration. And now you can foot switch whatever module channels you have in your system into the effects return of your combo amp, thus expanding its usability and, and range of sounds. Great, cool little feature. With the power station, you can now make use of that feature in an amp that does not have an effects loop. So now your vintage JMP, your vintage Super Reverb, your whatever, any amp that you have, that all it has to do is have a guitar input and a speaker output and you're golden. So what you do is you use the power station as it's intended to uh, control the volume of that amp and as a result of using that and having its effects loop you can tie the sin one or the sin two into the power station loop and thereby add channels 
to an amplifier that does not have a loop. And we tried it the other day and we went, oh man, this is stupidly good. Because if you're using a power station anyway to control the volume of that amp, it's too clean. You know, it's a little too loud for the gigs these days or whatever, but it's got this great sound. You just want to taper it down a little bit or even keep it roughly the same power output, but just push the amp to its sweet spot a little more so that you can play at that same volume without overdoing it. Then you can do that and you can add sin channels to that same amp and do a whole lot more with it without modifying it, without altering it, without doing anything, just plugging it in. So that was a really cool revelation that we had last week. Yeah, I would have never thought of that. Obviously, you can't add channels with a Synergy to an amp that doesn't have an effects loop. And that doesn't even have to be a classic amp. That just has to be an amp by someone who insists on not using effects loop, like freaking Joe freaking Bearded Morgan Man, um, who makes amazing amps, but doesn't want freaking effects loop. The fucker. Um, I, I, I love these amps. I mean... For me, the MVP sixty six. What a revelation! I'm I'm not a J, JTM kind of a person. That that's yeah. always like that squishiness, that fuzziness. Uh, it, mm. It's not it's not my thing. But because of Joe's amp, I started to understand why that's cool, and and also you know what guitar to use it with. And I've recorded so many things now with my tone folks, Elcaster, like a, a, a thin line. Uh, Teddy style with P90s mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. that amp, what, just like open chords, and you're like, okay, I I get it, I really get it. But that amp, first of all, no effects loop. So with the power station, I could put effects behind it. But if you have an amp like this and you wanted to add a different flavor to it, and if you were completely crazy and you're playing that amp, but you also want, I don't know, a Pitbull Ultra Lead, totally, the, <laughs> <laughs> totally the same player that plays an MVP 66 in a Pitbull Ultra Lead. But, yes, it's insane. But you can. And we get emails every day from insane people. So that potentiality is out there. So why not just embrace it? Hey, okay. Yeah, yep. it's insane. Try it. You'll love it. <laughs> Obviously, it's a more complex setup, and you might want to do it, you know, in, in Iraq and all that. So it's, it's uh, or Iran. <laughs> get it? Iraq, Iran. Hmm. So their countries. Um, we call that we call that dad humor here. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I have a lot of I have a I have a dead bod as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, we yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not just blowing smoke up his ass. I have I have all these units in the house in in in, in Studio B. Uh, technically, the PS100 has been here since last year. And technically, supposed to go back to Stephen. Uh, fuck him. Because he's not getting it back. There's no way. Uh, we're going to have to have a talk when the cameras are off. Because uh, I have a space. There's no higher. To me, there's no higher compliment than fuck you. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, have, I, have a, I have a space right there where my attenuators are. And that space that needs to be a power station. Because in here, um, with the MP system, what I do is everything's going into the aux. Which is great to go. Not IR, but, you know, simulate, whatever. But... I need to be able to actually put some of these amps into a cap, which is actually the Tone King right there. The amp portion and the cap portion are separated. So I can, with the amp switch, just send something into the Tone King. But if I have mm. any of the, I mean, if I have an SLO 100 on, it doesn't matter what the volume says, that's going to kill me. Mm. I, can't, mm. I can't use anything in this room without an attenuator. I'm old. I have tinnitus. It's, it's not safe. So... For me, the ideal situation would be ampede switcher going into the power station, running into that 112, and then any amp I play, I can actually nicely dial it in, and it'll be the, the perfect sound to actually test an amp in the room. Uh, am I going to drag in a 412 in here? No. You know, I mean, not going to happen. But that's going into that cap, and that's how I always had it set up with the, um, with the aux. Going with the aux into that into that cap, but now the problem is you spoiled me. Now that I heard the power station, I don't want to use the aux attenuator anymore. I love the aux for what it does on the digital side, but no way am I going to pump that into a cap after I felt what the power station feels like. Yeah, that uh, the the first time the first time we 
played through the proof of concept prototype, we knew. We knew something that we didn't know before, which was we've got something here. The first time I played through it and heard it, people were coming into my office from other parts of the building going, what is going on in here? Everybody knew immediately. They sensed something was happening and came in my office and listened and uh, watching me play. And they're like, what are you doing? And I explained it and they just went, it, it, it just was understood immediately that this was going to be a game changer. And I, I wonder we were, if someone- we trying to make a game changer. I was just fiddling around and thinking, this might work together with this and we could do this and blah, blah. And I'm playing and everybody's coming in going, what the hell have you done here? And uh, that that's that was the the birth of the concept was that it was exceeded our expectations by such a large amount that we knew that we had to just like run with it immediately. I wonder if someone is working on the perfect one, like on what the power station can do, but with all the digital on top of it. I know that two notes landed. A mind-blowing product with the Captor X. It's right there, and I've I've got several. Uh, it, it's it can do everything you want it to do, other than the amplification and and really the attenuation. It's got two levels of attenuation with the switch, and it can make it quieter, but it's not very satisfying. Um, but it's been quiet for a year and a half, so I want they have to be working on something new, and I know them well, and I love those guys. I don't know what they're working on. Don't think they're going to go tube, but if they did, that would be the everything in one, and that would be the one product that could rival what Fryad's built here. Um, but well, I, yeah, I think there's a, that, that we've been we've been thinking that for six years now. Like, when is somebody going to come and try to knock this off or knock us off? And um, we, you know, knowing what goes into it and what what has to be in there in order to make it do for the wide variety of people out there that it needs to do what it does, which is <clears throat> the power range that it can handle and the uh, flexibility of the reactive load behavior and the ability to dial in the power amp behavior with the presence and depth controls and compacting a great sounding tube power amp in that little box and have it in a little box and in a reasonably affordable price package uh and and a size and weight that's manageable there's there's the only thing that you can do to take it to the next level is add more stuff into it or shrink it down or do maybe a better solid state power amp in it maybe that flies maybe it doesn't there's all kinds of ways to approach that but right now we're uh we 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 talk about those kinds of things all the time. Is that practical? Is there a way to do this or do that? Or should we consider that? And yeah, maybe so. But we also have five other things in development that we are to us are more exciting and more and more I, interesting. I don't know of, how you could shrink it down more. It's tubes. It's transformers. It's tubes. Yeah. It's it's heat. Um, it, yeah. it 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 does weigh something. It has a certain size. If you're gonna stay with tubes, which is the whole idea. That I don't know if you can go anywhere. The, the only thing is that I can think of is, and not you guys doing it, but actually partnering with someone who's doing the digital end of things and combining that into one product. However, if I wanted to do that, I throw 249 bucks at it. I think 249. I buy Capta M, no, Cap M Plus, which is the, I just connected with XLR. And then I have the IR loader right on top of it. I mean, that product... That's been, that's been my feeling all along, which is the things that you would want to put inside it, maybe ideally to have it in one box, really, for the level of performance that the power, both power stations provide, you would want a cab emulation and a, an effects processor that's of equivalent level of performance to that. And the only thing that is is that meets that criteria are things like you have mentioned or an effects processor that is really much better than something that you would have included in a package and we always go back to the um the uh the example of 
the little portable television with the built-in VCR, well, you, you know, the, te the television still may be around and people still may watch them, uh, but nobody uses the uh, VCR part of it anymore or the cassette input player part of it anymore. When you start getting into all-in-one products like that, something is going to be it's going to become obsolete more than the rest of it and you have to be careful about that because you don't want to make a product that 75% of its reason to exist is still valid but the 25% that isn't that's obsolete upends the whole thing so that just goes back to the the concept of longevity of a product and trying to avoid uh, unnecessary obsolescence. Um, so for me personally, uh, if I'm going to weigh, well, I don't want to have another rack space dedicated to a, an effects processor to get really great effects processing. But the reality is that's exactly what I want. I don't want to compromise on the effects processing after I went to all the effort to get it to sound this good at this volume. Why do I want to mess with that? I don't. I want the best effects processing I can get out of it. And if I only care about something that's just plain convenient and nothing else, well, in my rig here, I've got a power station and a combo, and I'm using a little immerse reverb pedal because I don't really, I'm not really that wrapped up in all the effects processing. If I was, I've got a 2290 for delays. I love that thing. I would use that, or I would maybe get a single rack space unit that has really great reverbs and delays in it and use that, and then have another box that does the best cab sim output to an interface that I could get because the power station is the best thing sonically between the amp and the speaker that you can get. So I would want a comparative product. And so that then going back to your comment, which if you put comparative products like that of that quality all in that box, then you're digging it. You, then you're then it's a twenty five hundred dollar proposition. At that price, you can go buy the great stuff. And all you really bought was the convenience of having an all in one box. Absolutely. If, if you if you go in rack anyway, you're fully right. I can think of a rack based IR solution uh, right now, other than the Torpedo Studio, which is uh, great and expensive, and and it's it's an older product. Um, but that is what what I would see on that level. Okay, we're gonna let you go. Um, thank you for uh, the insight. So again, I was gonna put this in my PS a two ps2a video but uh that's i'll find out what i do with this um thank you steven <laughs> i don't know yeah i have a tendency to do that no uh, no it's, same I'm here uh, the problem is now in my ps uh why am i saying this wrong ps2a video uh, i will say all of this just by myself and then people watching this will hear it again but you know what maybe it's a good idea to repeat this stuff so um thanks for hanging out with us um, Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. I always love talking to you. And uh, same here. Um, again, sorry, but you're not getting it back. And uh, we'll, we'll put links below to all this stuff and animals at the end. That's okay. We'll make more. So no problem. <laughs>